Well, good morning. Welcome to church today. How many of you got more rest because of the time change? Raise your hand. You got more rest? How many of you feel less rested? Raise your hand. And there's more, less rested. So just if you snore this morning, just be careful. You might wake up the person next to you. But uh, I think I got less rest. I'm not sure. But that might be because we, we were driving to South Carolina. We had a quick, I think almost like 36-hour whirlwind trip. We drove up to see our daughter in South Carolina, and she was directing a play there at the college. And it was good, but we got back, and we are toast. We're tired. So I understand how you're feeling this morning, but praise God, we have another week to serve the Lord, and it's a good week to start with. Why don't we all stand together this morning? If you have your Bibles, 1 Timothy chapter number 2, and we're going to read this morning uh, from Paul's letter to Timothy. If you don't have a Bible, you can look on the screen just behind me. Good morning. Let's read God's Word together. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of, of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Pastor Jason. So Paul wrote to Timothy that we should, in fact, he mentioned pray for and give thanks for and make intercessions for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority. So I think it's fitting this morning that we should pray for our president. We need to pray for President Biden, for Vice President Harris. We need to pray for um, those running for the presidency. We need to pray for uh, Donald Trump and for J.D. Vance. I think we need to pray for Kamala Harris and for Tim Walz. We need to pray for our governor, uh, Governor DeSantis. And many of you live in different areas around here. So whether it's the mayor or those who hold certain seats, I don't think it's wrong uh, to name names and to cry out to God and say, God, you work in your way. Help us as your people to be faithful no matter who is elected or not elected. And help us, Lord, to look to you as the sovereign leader. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word and for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who has come into the lives and the hearts of those who know you. Lord, we pray this morning that as we think of our nation, that, Lord, you would be with our leaders. Lord, they are on this global stage. They literally have the power of life and death in their hands. Our men and women uh, who are serving our great country are around the world, Lord, and many families are still here at home. We think of those running in this election, Lord, and the platforms that they represent. God, we pray that you would help us to be faithful, to look just a little above Washington to see your throne, where you're seated, that God, you're in charge and that we should trust you. So Lord, we want to be faithful to say thank you for what you've given to us. We live in a great nation. You've given us great freedom. And now, Lord, we want to make sure that as Americans, those of us who have the opportunity to vote, that Lord will exercise our right to do so. But most of all, Lord, we'll leave it in your hands. Help us, Lord, this morning as we're at church to worship you in spirit and in truth. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oh 
down why start to worry now why start to worry now he is still the lord of all we see and he is still the loving father watching over It's a new day dawning, it's time to sing. 
sing a song now that's been a blessing to us in the past. Um, it's a really it's a really simple song, but it gives it gives glory to the Lord and it really just calls out the fact that we as believers, you know, we have we have a life here, we have so many blessings, but ultimately if we are in Christ like the apostle Paul, we should ultimately desire for the time when we're with the Lord and so we can cry out even so come asking for for God and telling God, God, we're waiting for you. We're doing what you have called us to do, but we're also looking forward to that day when you're coming for us. So hopefully this is a blessing to you all. All of creation, all of the earth, Make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint. Let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride. Church, ready for you, every heart longing for our King. We sing, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. There will be justice.
Malachi chapter 2. We're continuing our study uh, through the book of Malachi, and we're on part 6, or message 6 here. We're looking today at verses 4 through 9, and what a great song, especially in light of what is approaching us on Tuesday. I know many of us, many of you are praying for our country and are thankful that we have an opportunity as believers to take part in this election, but we we definitely need the Lord's help, if, if not just to make the political ad stop and the text. I don't know. I've opted out of so many different things, reported so many things as spam. Hopefully, on, by Tuesday night, it'll all be over with that. But our country, as we know, needs a lot of help. Malachi was in the same situation because prior to um, the book of Matthew, between Malachi to Matthew were 400 years, as we know, that were silent from God. And during that time, you had religious groups rising up. You had all of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You had Rome coming in. You had civil war. You had all these things breaking out in the nation at the time. But before that, Malachi was trying to get the people's attention But he started not in their homes. He didn't start in Washington, as it were. He didn't start in the school system. He he didn't start in all of those places. He started at the temple with the priests. He started with those who were leading the church or the temple worship, as it were. And so Malachi's letter that he is giving to the people, he is responding to their sarcastic questions. This is the second one that's on the screen just behind me. And when God is telling them what they have done, they simply said, how have we disrespected? How have we dishonored? How have we been irreverent in your name? So much so that as we've looked in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, God says to Malachi to say to the people, because of what's in your heart, Because you have brought these vain offerings, these corrupt offerings to me, he said in the verses, I will smear dung on your faces. It's kind of a grotesque, a pretty graphic scene. But God says, that is what's in your heart, and I want to make sure that it's going to be exposed because I've rejected it. And so before we look at Washington, before we look at um, the state and the local levels, before we look at our educational system, before we look at the recreation, the hobbies, all of those things, before we look at the home, God always says judgment must begin at the house of God. And if we can't take care of our own in the righteous way with judgment, looking at those who lead the church, who are responsible for and the care for the souls that are within the church, the flock of God, then how dare we lecture those outside of the walls if we can't do what God has already told us to do? And as we've pointed out in weeks past, so many stand before their congregations on a weekly basis, and they know God's Word, but they twist God's Word. They don't say, thus saith the Lord, it is hath God said. And so many are redefining their role in the church and in the world, inviting the world into the church, and then taking the church outside into the world, and you can't tell the difference. So Malachi's message here is people who need change, but we have a God who never does. And of course, the question that he hopes to answer, there are seven questions they come back to God with. This is the second one. Now, before we jump in, let's go to our next slide. I wanted to at least pause for a moment um, because I have this slide and then I have one more after that. Thank you, Joanne. So we sang this morning the, that song, God is in Control. Now that's a throwback song. It's, it's an older song, but it's Uh, There's some new songs this month that Pastor Chris and I and Pastor Weston that we have prayed about, we've talked about, and with the the group here that's helping to lead worship. And these were prayed over and carefully selected as a part of what we're trying to sing, um, not only to the Lord, but to remind ourselves that God is in control. We're in election season, the election cycle. And so if you haven't heard that song, I would encourage you, if you don't have iTunes or you have YouTube, whatever, go and listen to that song. There's a lot of groups out there that do that God is in control. Next Sunday, as a part of our worship, we're going to be doing the song Sovereign Over Us. How many of you have heard that song before? Okay, Who has not heard the song, which is just about everybody? So the reason I'm telling you this, I'm going to put it in the email as well. The words of the song, we, a couple of years ago, I think Claire and I, we have sang this song And I think we might have done Is He Worthy before, but the words of that song, especially post-Tuesday, 
It's the Lord who is sovereign over us, not Biden, not Trump, not Harris, not the global elite, whoever they may be. The Lord, He's on the throne. And as Christians in a, in a gathering, we need to remind ourselves not just of the hymns of the faith, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come. I'm a worm. I, I have amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, for all of these things. But there are other songs that remind us that God is in control. We, don't be shaken by what you see, by what you hear, by what might come. And at the end of the day, God is sovereign. In fact, I love how Joseph put it at the end of the book of Genesis when his brothers were worried because dad had died. And they all said, now that dad's d gone, he's dead. Are you going to turn the knives on us because of what we did to you so long ago? And he says, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And so ultimately, he knew, Joseph recognized that God was on the throne. And although things happen to us and happen around us, let's not lose our minds. And, and truly, let's not lose our hearts because it is discouraging with what we see, what we might see. But God is sovereign. Then is he worthy? And I love the part of that song, is he worthy? How many of you have heard that song, is he worthy? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, that means a lot more have not. That's good. Now, it's not the only songs we're singing with the other songs, but is he worthy? And in the chorus, when you're singing it, um, the people respond, he is. It's powerful. Because ultimately, why we're here right now, we're here at church. We gather not because we look alike. We're educated in the same way. We're even from the same neck of the woods we're all different ages, different genders. We're, we're young, old, some are parents, some are not, some are widowed, some are divorced, some are blended family, some are nuclear. So we, we're all different. The, the thing that binds us together is not even our team, not even our location. It's that Christ has brought us and made us one. It's Jesus. And without Christ, without the Lord bringing us together as a people that are called out from the world, then we would have nothing to shout about. We actually would come in here and we'd be whining, we'd be crying. We might be complaining about what we're seeing in the world. But because of Christ, because of what He's done, we can say, is He worthy? He is. So I want to encourage you as you look ahead to the weeks that are coming and what's coming even on Tuesday, that you would remember that God is in control and that He is sovereign over us and He is worthy. Okay, let's go to our next slide. And I thank you so much. So this morning... As a part of this, this has been a three-week ordeal trying to get through this second chapter. There's a, a character or a tribe that we're going to meet in this particular chapter. It's the tribe of Levi. It's a man named Levi, and I've listed it for you on the screen. Levi was an example of strong, godly leadership. And so much that God used Levi as an example to these corrupt priests and to the people. And he says, this is the one you should pattern your ministry and your lifestyle after. Now, before you know, we go any further. I want you to know that, of course, this message and what Malachi is saying directly is to the priest. He's speaking to those leading the temple. And you say, well, I'm not a priest. I'm not a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not a missionary. So I can just put it in park, watch some highlights on my phone, text my friends. I'm out. No, this actually is for every single person. You might not be a priest in the Levitical sense in the Old Testament, but the Bible says that Christ has abolished the priesthood. He is the great high priest. You and I don't have to go through a man to have forgiveness. You don't have to go through a person to have your prayers answered. You don't have to go through a person to have your sins forgiven. And there are other religious groups around that say, unless you pray this prayer, unless you, you recite these words, and you go to this place, and you do these things, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You can't know God unless you do this. Christ is our great high priest. And in like fashion, in the New Testament, He has made you and I, if you're a believer, you have access to God. You are a priest unto God. So you are part of that family. So you are responsible for how you walk with Christ, how you live this life, and what you do with the words that you basically use every single day. So it really brings it into focus, not just the priests as we see, or the pastors or the missionaries, but every single believer. So the question is, do we need spiritual leaders in the church, at home, in our nation, in Washington, at the school, on the job, or on the field? Of course. 
we do. And this is what Malachi is addressing. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to look down at chapter number two. Let's look at verse number one and let's read. And now, O ye priests, this commandment, this charge is for you. If ye will not hear and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already because ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts. And one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know, verse 4, that I have sent this commandment or this charge unto you, that my covenant, this is the promise that God made, might be with Levi. This was a man, but it was also a tribe, the tribe of Levi. They were the group responsible of the 12 tribes of Israel to go through um, leading the people in worship. And they were responsible for the sacrificial system. My covenant, verse 5, was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me, or he was in awe. He worshipped me and was afraid before my name. For 6, the law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn away many from iniquity. For 7, for the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. Notice who he's speaking to here. Verse 1, it says, you priest. He says, verse 8, but ye, you priest, you pastors, you missionaries, you leaders, he's saying, you've walked out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. What they were doing with the law was putting it, who was it? Was it B.R. Lakin, Vance Havner, someone said, when they go to church, we're not feeding spiritual giraffes. You need to put it low enough where people can get it, where they can understand it. And of course, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is our teacher. So we should make sure that we're not confusing people. We're not helping people to trip over the gospel because the gospel is simple. But we need to be very clear. He says, you people, you have caused many to stumble at the law. In fact, Jesus, how did Jesus summarize the law? Does anyone remember? How did Jesus summarize the law? He summed up, summarized it in two ways, two points. What did he say? Does anyone remember? How did Jesus summarize the law in the New Testament? What? Love God and love others. And he said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. That's a great line. They hated that because ultimately they had to have all these extra laws, all these extra things to make sure you were obeying the true legalist, that would make sure you could not see heaven's gate unless your hair was so short, or unless the threads were just right, or unless the food was the certain way, or unless the hands were washed in the right way, or unless, you know, religious groups can't legislate morality from the outside in. It is Christ who changes and transforms people from the inside out. And anytime we as a church get off center from what the Bible says about the transformation that takes place once the Holy Spirit moves inside, we are missing the mark. It's not our job to change people. It is our job to tell the truth to people and then let God handle the rest. And this is what happened. He says, you have caused many, verse number eight, to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse nine, therefore, because of this, have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people? He says, they look at you and they disrespect you. According as you have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us in the few short moments we have. Lord, remind us of your truth. Help us, Lord, to know that what you say is most important, not what I say, not what any politician says. Lord, help us to know that through your Holy Spirit, he teaches us your word. Lord, you say that you are the word from the beginning. So, Lord, thank you for coming and breathing life into us. And, Father, thank you for sending your Son to die for us upon the cross to prepare a way for us who did not believe, who were dead in our trespasses and sins. And, Lord, we have been saved by the grace of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would use your word this morning to speak to our hearts. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, here we see Malachi's message. I've laid it out for you the last couple of weeks. Let me remind you, number one, he showed the responsibilities and the background of the priests. Number two, last week he gave a rebuke to the priest, and we read that earlier. He said, because you've done this, I will smear graphically dung on your face. It's 
really one of the only times you see this graphic description. But he also threatens their blessings and threatens to send a curse upon their descendants and upon their ministry. Note what he said here in this verse, number two, if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, I will send a curse is what he's saying. He says, you won't honor me. So we ultimately see that divine discipline comes from a heart of unconditional love. If you're a parent and you love your kids, you're going to, uh, it's not you're demanding respect and putting your, 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 your fist down and you're saying, you will respect me, but here is God who deserves respect and honor and the people are not giving it to him. And he says, because of that, because you won't give me the respect that I deserve, it happens because you won't listen, you won't lay it to heart. The word listen and obey, trust and obey. In fact, all throughout the book of Proverbs, Solomon is writing and he's saying to his sons, to his children, if you will listen, bend your ear, be attentive, my son, hear my words. Here is the Lord speaking to his people today. Listen to what I'm saying. If you speak to your child, your teenager, your, your, uh, even your toddler, or uh, your elementary school student, and you're speaking to them about doing something, and you call their name, and when you tell them to pick up something, or to do something, and they look at you, they look at that, and then they just turn and they walk the other way. It's on, right? It's on. I, no one here has ever done that. No one here will ever do that. But you say to do something, you call their name, and they just look at you, and then they turn and walk away. That's what the priests were doing to God. God had spoken to them through His Word. They had the example that they had been given through the generations. The people were coming to the temple, and they heard God speaking through His Word, and they heard it, and they just kind of turned away and says, well, we're going to do it our way. We're going to do it the way that we see fit. So honoring God involves listening and obeying, or listening and applying God's Word. The question is, you're here this morning, and you're listening. Now, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm very, very tired. We came home yesterday from this trip and been with my parents in Greenville just for the 36 hours. And even this morning, I can feel it like behind my eyes. Some of you, you have that same look, like the time change. I'm like, this is the perfect weekend. We get an extra hour. But I kept waking up all throughout the night thinking I was going to oversleep. And I can feel it behind my eyes. There, there is a thing I learned in Algebra 1 that you can be in a class and you don't have to listen to anything. You can be present with your eyes open and you can sleep. Some of you do the same thing maybe in church. And you're like, this is like algebra. But you're here and you're listening. But there's a difference between listening and applying or obeying the word. The priest heard what God said. They refused to do what God said. And there's a big difference. If we don't hear and apply, this word honor in Hebrew implies weight and respect. They were giving God no respect. They were saying, God, we don't trust you. We don't listen to you. We don't need you. We'll do things our way. And of course, God said in verse 3, because of this, I will smear this dung on your face. Now, here's number three, our main point today. What is the right example then? He already gave the background of the priest. He rebuked the priest. Now, what is the example? Some of you in your life, you have a hero, a mentor. You have someone that you look up to, someone that in business, you're like, I pattern things that I do in my business after this person. Maybe as a parent, you have your mom, your dad, your grandparent. This person raised me. Maybe there's a, an athlete that's a hero that you patterned your game after. Whatever it might be, here is God mentioning this man's name, this tribe, and saying, here is the example for you. Now, I, I have to tell you now, when we look at politics, okay, I grew up in North Carolina. Michael Jordan. I wanted to be like Mike. Okay? I wanted to be like Mike. Right, Richard? Did you want to be like Mike? Of course, every kid wanted to be like Mike. I wanted to be like Mike. Although I didn't have the shoes, I didn't look like Mike, I couldn't jump like Mike. I was from North Carolina, and that was close enough, and I played ball. I love basketball, but being like Mike meant more than just basketball. It was an attitude, a way of life. Be a winner, all that kind of stuff. When we look at four leaders or heroes today, who, who do we look to to be like when our kids are looking for those people? When we as 
young men, young women, as we're looking for people. In fact, the New Testament talks about that within the context of the church, that young men should seek out the mentorship of older men, and older men should be available to speak into the lives of younger men. And older women, it uses the term aged women, should do the same for the younger women. They should teach them how to keep at home. They should teach them what to do and how to raise their kids. And so often in the church, we don't even know each other. I wonder if, if we didn't have name tags, and we don't this morning, I've thought about this. We have so many new faces that many of you maybe don't even know one another. Maybe you sit on one side, you don't know anyone over here. The church should be a place, and it's corny and cheesy, I, that song from Cheers just popped into my mind, where everybody knows your name, right? You should come to church and people know who you are. You should come to church and you should have that attitude, not just of worship, but of of fellowship. We come to hear the word, but we do come to fellowship one with another. And here is what happened. God said, the example that you should be following, priests, is Levi. You should look at what he did, his life, his words, his walk, his character, his conduct. Now with politicians, there's some good things and there's some bad things about them. With athletes, there's some good things and some bad things. With, with teachers, with, with parents, but with the Lord Jesus Christ, we can look to Him and say, there's nothing that He lacks. But here God is putting up someone that maybe we don't know about, a man named Levi, a tribe of Levi. And during the, the event of the golden calf, we won't take time to turn there, but in the golden calf incident, when Moses was on the mountain, Joshua was down just a little further. Moses is up there talking to God and God talking to him. The people were down in the valley. You remember this. They were down there in the wilderness. And what were they doing? They were getting naked. They were building this calf. They were taking off their earrings, their nose rings, their necklaces, their rings. And they were giving them to Aaron. Aaron, who was a priest, who was supposed to lead the people closer to God. And he ultimately would blame the people. Well, Moses, the people made me do it. And what they did during that time, this particular tribe, when Moses came down and he threw the the commandments down, And he basically said, who is on the Lord's side? And here's this group of people, this tribe, and they went around and during that day, they they went to town. I mean, it's an ugly scene. And God purged out those who were doing these wicked deeds. He is pointing back to a group and to a man and to a, a, a group of people who looked at God in more of a way that is holy than what we look at Him today. So I want to ask you, as we look at these points this morning, who is your example? Who is he or she? And and I would say this even more so, someone is looking at you and I. Someone's looking at us. It might be your grandchild. It might be your kid. It might be someone in the neighborhood. It might be a coworker. Someone that doesn't, you don't even know they're looking at you and they're watching you on your team, on the job, in class. You're the Christian kid. Or you're someone that's been through a lot in your life and you're sitting in Algebra 1 with your eyes open, you're trying to stay awake, and you know that in school or on the field, you still have to be a Christian. You're just not a Christian on Sunday. I checked in, I check out. Levi was someone who was a godly example and we need more people like him. So in so going through this text, I want to give you these points and just tell you what a spiritual leader according to this text is. So number one, look at verse four. A spiritual leader must speak God's message of truth, not his own. Look at verse four. And he says, and ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you that my covenant might might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. God's commandments or his charges are not suggestions or hints. He tells us how to live and he defines right and wrong with authority. But sound teaching must flow from a godly life. If we are simply telling people, here are the rules, and we're not living by said rules, if we're parents and we're saying, you need to do this, while we're acting the fool at home, we're yelling and screaming, we're not even having a relationship that we should in front of our own children, then how can we say that we know God? And how can we say that we want kids and we want others to come to know the Lord if our words are not even measuring up to God's standard, or if our words are silent. Here's what he said. Ye shall know that I've sent this commandment unto you. I've given you a message to speak. It's not your own message, Levi. I want you to speak what I've told you. What has God told the church to speak today? What has God told the church to speak? Has he given us the Republican platform to speak on? 
the Democratic platform to speak on? The independent platform to speak on? Is this what, why we're here at church? Just because we look alike, we vote alike, we sound alike, we act alike, we live around the same area? Is that what we're supposed to do today? We're not all Gator fans, Bulldog fans, Tar Heel fans, whatever. We're all different. But the thing that binds us together is that we believe that this is God's word. It is eternal. It is immutable. God's word does not change, nor do his precepts for how I live, how I act, how I raise my family, what I do as a man, as a, as a husband, as a parent. God has something to say about that. And these priests in this day had ignored everything that they had been taught and says, you know what, it doesn't really matter. God, we don't really respect you, so we're going to do things our way. And you and I may not say that with our lips, but do we say that with our lives? God, I don't really respect you. You know, I'll, I'll give you the leftovers. We talked about that last week. The last, the least, the leftovers. They were bringing their diseased animals. They were bringing the lame and the maimed animals that they wouldn't give to their worst enemy. And they were saying, well, I guess, God, I'll give you my, I'll give you my change, Lord, here you go. And it's so interesting, in the New Testament, the widow's might, less than a penny. She threw that in. The disciples were there like, look at this woman. She ain't given nothing. And he says she gave all. She gave all that she had. We as believers today could take a page from those who give from the heart. Not just what they have in their pocket, but what they have in their heart. God sees and God knows. And one day, we will stand before a holy God and give an account of how we have lived and how we have loved. So number one, a leader must speak God's message, not as on number two. A spiritual leader should fear God or have respect. Look at verse number five. He says, I gave to them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. You know, so often we overemphasize God's love and neglect the fear of God. The world does that. Did you know God is love? In fact, politicians they, they tell you God is love. This is what we should do. God is love. But God is a God also to be feared, to be revered, to know that here I am, as the song says, a worm such as I, that term that he used as he wrote that song, that God would look upon me. And when you walk out here on a sunny day and it's rained, you see these worms crawling across the, the sidewalk and they're dying right there on the pavement. That's what the, the writer of the song says. When God looks at me, that's what he sees in my sin. But when we come to Christ, he sees much more than that. But it's that respect, that reverence of God. God, you are in heaven and I upon earth. But a spiritual leader should fear God. In fact, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Before we can know anything, we need to fear God the Lord. Number three, number three. So number one, a spiritual leader should speak God's message. Number two, a spiritual leader should fear God. Number three, a spiritual leader should know and teach the truth. Look at verse six. He breaks this up, and I'm going to break it up in four ways. A spiritual leader should know and teach the truth. Look at verse number six. The law of truth or true instruction was in his mouth. Now, watching coaches on the sidelines, some of you watched them yesterday, they're giving instruction and at the same time giving rebuke. Sometimes they're slapping them on the helmet. They're grabbing them by, by the face mask. They're letting them know, don't do that again or good job. Here is what God is telling Malachi to tell the people. The law of truth was in his mouth. He, when he spoke, something came out of it that was worth listening to. If all we speak are, is our opinion of things, and especially as we've talked behind the sacred desk, behind the, the pulpit or in church, if all we're speaking is the talking points from the talking heads and we're just getting together, collaborating, well, what do people need to hear? Let's just talk about the things, the marshmallow uh, goodness. Let, let's, let's sugarcoat everything. Let's not get up, give out the hard truth. Here's what he said. Uh, a spiritual leader should know and should teach the truth. Truth is in and truth comes out. What is in someone's heart comes out when they're squeezed. And this is what Paul talks about. Even though we're pressed down, shaken together, all these things, we, are, we feel on every side that things are falling apart. We know that God is in control. He's in my heart. A spiritual leader should know and teach the truth. Number four, look at verse six again. A spiritual leader should have godly character and conduct. He says, an iniquity was not found in his lips. Again, he's focusing a lot here because he's already focused on the heart. What is on your lips? What comes out of the heart? 
Jesus put it this way in the New Testament. It's not what goes into a man that defiles a man, but what comes out of a man that corrupts him. So it's not broccoli. It's not asparagus. It's not uh, all those things that maybe you don't like, maybe certain things that go in. We even will preach against the, the ills of certain addictions. We'll preach against certain things that people shouldn't do, but it's really not those things that go in, but the things that come out. People don't die and go to hell because they take drugs. People don't die and go to hell because they drink or because they beat someone up or because they murder. They don't die and go to hell. That is in the heart already. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, that God looked down from heaven and He saw the evil continually that it was in the hearts. It's in the heart before it's in the hand. I might think about it here long before I actually do it or I run to it. What's in the heart this morning? As you're here, as you're listening in algebra class and your eyes are open, your ears are open, what's in the heart? A spiritual leader should have godly character and conduct. It says, verse 6, iniquity was not found in his lips. So the way he talked was different. How do you talk? How do I talk? Not to people on Sunday morning, but as soon as we leave the building, as soon as we get to school, as soon as we get to the office, as soon as we're with our friends. That's one reason there's good music out there, and I like certain music, but ultimately with what some things are being said in that, it's hard to hear that because you're putting that into your heart. Certain things being said, certain things being done. So a spiritual leader should have godly character. Number five, quickly, a spiritual leader should have a close relationship with God. Look at verse six. It says, he, speaking of Levi, walk with me in peace and equity or uprightness. He spoke with me or walked with me in peace and equity. He had a level or a straight walk. When Claire and I lived in Connecticut before we had kids, my roommate from college, his name was Vinny. Okay, and it's just like it sounds. And, and Vinny is a pastor in Boston right now. He is a, um, I'd love to have Vinny and his wife here. I grew up with his wife, Heather. Heather was Claire's roommate in college, and Vinny and I were roommates. Um, but Vinny, when, when we moved to Connecticut, he lived in a part of Connecticut at the time. And we went to this play, and the play was The Sound of Music. And I always remember, it was like the local like if, if we had a local theater here and people from the community came together to practice and they put on the sound of music and one of the cast members, I don't even know if it was the Julie Andrews character, it was one of the, the major characters, it threw me off because she walked with a, a major limp. It was like she had like a wooden leg almost. You know, when she was walking, it was like, and always just, you know, we were, I was the college guy like, doing Vinny, like, look at this. Well, you know, we were kind of goofing and laughing, but the idea that he says here, equity, that the people who were leading the temple were walking kind of, you know, one day they're up, one day they're down. They're not balanced in their life. There's something not straight about them. You know, and that's what we always, can I use the word harp? We talk about this, even in our own lives, that we shouldn't just walk straight on Sunday and then every other day of the week we walk like the world. That on Wednesdays when we get back at church, we walk kind of straight and then we're back like the world. And this is what he said of Levi in verse number six. He walked with me in peace and equity. That means he had the peace in his heart. He had the peace of God that rested upon him, but also he walked straight. He lived straight. And it's not enough for us to walk like the world six days of the week and we're walking straight like the Lord on one day of the week. That's not what a believer should do. Number six, quickly look at verse Number six, again, the last part, a spiritual leader will be effective and see lives change. Look at verse six, the last part, and he did turn many away from iniquity. You know, here's the thing, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, now, what is old? What does that mean? It, it's, it's a principle, I mean, but it's a promise, it says here, he did turn many away from iniquity. A spiritual leader will be effective and will see lives changed. Going to camp is awesome. We go to camp. Having VBS is so great. Having Sunday school, Freedom Kids, it's wonderful. Having Bible camps and all those things and revivals, that's wonderful. But after we make our decision on the mountain, there's always a time to walk down to the valley because we do our living down here. I wish we could stay on the mountain. Those 
mountain highs of the spiritual decisions that we make when we're away from our phones, our friends, our family. Oh man, God just spoke to me. Yes, he did. But that same God who spoke to you there, he speaks in the valley. And you've got to walk straight with him. And in fact, what he said here, lives will change. When does that happen? Well, as God works a hold of me and he works a hold of you, what's the song we quoted last week? He's still working on me to make me what ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, all that stuff. God is still a sanctification. God is using His Word through His Spirit and by His people, His church, to sharpen us. What's the other verse in the book of Proverbs? It says this, iron sharpens iron. How can you and I as believers be sharpened if we don't even show up? How can we be shaped by God's Word and with God's people if we refuse to even come to the gathering of the saints? How can we expect to know God and what He wants? Well, I'll just do this at home or I'll, I, I think it's... You no, know, this is the priority. This is what He said to Levi and to the tribe. He's giving him as the example. They walk straight and lives were changed because of it. I think it was Martin Luther that said this, always, I love this quote, always preach in such a way that if the people listening do not come to hate their sin, they will instead come to hate you. Now, my grandfather probably lived by that because as a pastor, he was like, he just laid it out. And we need that. It's not sugar-coated truth. We, people need to hear it plain and true. But I'm telling you, unless we as believers can get our act together, spiritually speaking, our spiritual house in order, it doesn't matter how we sound, how we look, how we give, if our heart is not right with a holy God. And that's ultimately, we think that voting on Tuesday will change everything. But unless we make the vote with God and say, God, I am with you. What you want, I will do. I will follow your ways. It changes every four years, but it does not change with the Lord. And for the church, for the church, we have to know that God's Word has our best interest. It's going to give us the medicine that we don't like. It's going to give us the thing that pierces. Hebrews talks about that. The Word of God is quick. It is powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's like a surgeon's scalpel. It goes right in and it cuts out the pieces. There's parts of God's Word that when you read it, that's good. Other parts where it just kind of goes in like, oh man. And we need someone when we go to church to step on our toes. We need someone that will call out those things in our lives and say, God wants more for you. It might feel like we have a string of losses, you know, as a team. Boy, we just can't win. Look at us as Christians. But when we look at the New Testament and we see the atmosphere, the environment in which it was written, they were being thrown to the lions. They were being crucified. They were being arrested. They were being beaten. They were being spit upon. Did any of you this week have any of that happen to you because you were a Christian in America? Can I say this? It's in Hebrew or Greek. Heck, no. You didn't have that happen to you. I don't think so. And if you did, the Bible says that they went out and rejoiced that they could share in the suffering of the Savior because, not because they lived loose and people didn't understand, but because they lived holy and people were like, I don't like that. The world is not supposed to like that. We're not supposed to be like that. We're supposed to show the love of the Savior by how we live. So a spiritual leader should be effective in ministry and he or she will see lives change. But we leave the changing up to God. Quickly, just three more points here. Number seven, a spiritual leader should faithfully guard God's word. Look at verse seven. He says, for the priest's lips should keep knowledge, keep or preserve. That means to guard, put something there. In fact, Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. It's the same idea. Keep God's word, preserve God's word. The one, the one thing that, you know, with, the, with our devices, with our computers, so many of us, maybe we read the Bible in the morning or at home on our device. Now, I remember as a kid seeing, and again, it's a visual thing, seeing my mom, my dad, going to my grandparents and seeing them open a Bible. They would be seated at a table or in their study and, or before bed, and they would read the Bible. And so often, you know, we pick up our phone and maybe we are reading it in the morning. And it's something about this, but it's not just about guarding this. And that's why we 
open up. We have congregational reading. I think it's very important. We need to have responsive reading. You and I need to come to church. We need to pray together. We need to read God's Word together. We need to worship together. We need to understand the Word. We need to fellowship together. But we can't do that with a closed Bible. And we don't just open this book on Sunday. This is what he's saying here in verse number 7. A, pre a priest's lips should keep knowledge, keep or preserve something that is rare and costly. This is valuable. Someone asked me the other day, so this, I've got this ring on, and I don't really wear a lot of rings, but I put this on last week. Um, my dad gave me this ring um, just this past year, and it was my grandfather's. And, and you know, he passed uh, in 2003, right, when my, our second uh, daughter was born, and she wasn't able to go to the funeral. But my, my grandfather, this was, he went to Fruitland Bible College. It's where Dr. Charles Stanley taught. And uh, so he went there. He was someone that was saved from a rough life. And, and my dad, just in passing, while we were together at some family event, he pulled me aside and said, Paul, Paul, I wanted you to have this. And I mean, it's, he's been gone at that time over 20 years. And so I was telling someone the other day, you know, when I'm like, even I wore it last Sunday and I've worn it Wednesday and today, it just, it's a, a reminder to me of not just the heritage that you and I have. And even if you didn't come from a family where the word of God was upheld, and maybe it was a fight every night at your house, but God has changed your life and something is different now. You start the legacy. That's what he's saying about Levi. In fact, one stat said only one in five church-going people read their Bibles and pray every day. Most Americans spend more time watching TV, enjoying sports, or participating in their hobbies. They're not saturating their minds with the truth to resist worldly influences. And if all we do when we come to church is, I give you, you know, a verse and a poem and short and sweet and we're out to eat, then find another church, find another pastor. Now, do I go long? Yeah. And Paul told me, bad for y'all, that right before the clock is broken, so I don't even see what time it is right now. So it could be like, don't tell me what time it is, I know. But if we are just trying to get through to get out without seeing lives changed and God uplifted, that's not why we're here. We're here to encourage one another to grow in God's Word. Number eight, look at verse number seven again. In turn, so a spiritual leader should do these things. In turn, what should the people do? Look at verse number seven, the last part. He says, and they should seek the law at his mouth. In turn, the people should seek God's truth from him. I don't go to Washington to get advice from anybody. I don't go to Tallahassee to get that or Gainesville. I don't have to go to the radio. I don't go to my friends. I have mentors, but I, the first stop as a Christian is I go to the Bible. And in fact, what we see here, the people, in turn, they weren't going to these priests because they had corrupted what God had said. So he says here about Levi, because he did these things, he lived this way, he spoke this way, it was in his heart. Verse 7, it says, they should seek the law at his mouth. They came to him and says, what's up? How should we live? What are we doing? Tell us. Speak to us. I wrote this down. Parents we should live long enough, we pray, for our kids to come back around to what we not only said, but, but how we lived. We talked about this in our Sunday school class this morning. Had some very big disagreements with my dad when I lived at home. Enough to where, you know, my mom cried a couple of times because I was a, a you know, hard-headed, can I say fool, um, at times as an 18-year-old. And my dad, that doesn't go in my house. And but at the same time, I have gone back there many times to say, you were right. I should have listened. I didn't listen because I thought I knew everything. Here's what's happening in the temple worship or in the church, if we could put it in that context. This is why Christian education is so important. You say, what is Christian education? My kids go to public school. My kids are homeschooled or whatever. Christian education is putting them under the tutelage of someone who is opening the Word of God and teaching them, not just at church, but moms and dads teaching at home. You say, well, I'm not qualified. Yes, you are. If you're a believer and you have kids and God has gifted them to you, Psalm 127, and if the Lord is building the house, God has given you your family for a reason. 
He's given you the opportunity to teach that young life or that teenager wherever they are in whatever stage, just to be a real person. Do we have our personality flaws and defects? Do we sometimes go off the handle or sometimes get like a mouse? Yeah. But use your voice because your kids look at you and respect you. They hear what you're saying. We need to live long enough. This is what happened. The people would come back around in turn. They came to Levi and says, Levi, we've seen what you've said, what, how you've lived. We've seen all these things. You actually believe and you behave in the same way. I pray to God that I live long enough for my kids as well. And for those that I instruct, your neighbors that see you, your friends in school, those on the field with you, it's why it's so important. This is your part. Number nine, look at verse number eight. Leaders who turn from, he says, a word of warning, leaders who turn from and twist God's word will cause people to fall. Look at verse eight. So he says, but, or contrast, but ye are departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. I love this quote by Matthew Henry. I've said this many times. Many are led astray or into false ways by the false move or the wrong step of one godly man. Many people are led astray by one false step of a good man. It might have been your daddy or your mama who, you know, did something and it let you down. It might have been a pastor, a youth pastor, a worship leader, someone in church that really did you over and it made you to walk out of the church said, those Christians, those people, and man, I am sorry. Here's what he said. These leaders have caused many to stumble. They have twisted and turned from God's Word. Spiritual leaders greatly influence people's lives and can easily cause others to stumble. That's why James chapter 3 says there are stiffer penalties and accountability for someone that will use God's Word as a weapon or as a stumbling block. This Bible is a sword, but it's not a sword that cuts heads off. It's not a stumbling block that we throw out to sinners. You wicked sinner, look at you, and where we're trying to trip people up. It's, it's a guiding light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. As Christians, as Baptists in particular, whatever denomination you are, take a pick. If we get off center of the word of God, we've lost our way. And people begin to stumble. The priest should have kept the word of God with knowledge, reverence, and obedience, but instead they departed and many people fell. And finally, number 10, here's the last verse, verse 9. Leaders who disobey God's word and show bias are not respected by God or the people. Look at verse 9, finally. Therefore, because of all of this, have I also made you, priests, contemptible and base. He says, no one respects you before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Three weeks ago, I read, what, 20 different scandals that are going on in our country right now, just in the church. Not only the doctrine that has fallen apart, but some of the woke agenda, some of the LGBTQ agenda that has come into the church, some of the political agendas that have come into the church. And God has been kicked off of his throne in the church. Christ has been removed as the head, and we have set up these other heads in the church. And here's what God said, I don't respect you. That's what he's telling the leaders. And he's telling not only the leaders, he says the people don't respect you. They see. I heard a quote, I think it was Dr. Howard Hendricks taught at Dallas Theological. He said, um, children, I think it was him, children aren't turned off by the sin of their parents. They're turned off by the hypocrisy of their parents. We all sin. We stub our toe, we step on a Lego, we have a bad day. It's just the covering up. If we cover our sins, we will not prosper. And as men and women of God, as parents, as leaders, we need to make sure that we fear God and keep His commandments. Because if we refuse to fear God and keep His commandments, David said this, the fear of man brings a snare, Psalm 34. And if we fear man more than we fear God, we're going to get tripped up every time. It doesn't matter what other people think. It matters what God thinks. You say, well, they'll laugh at me on my team or in the class or on my job. They, they won't understand. Of course they're not going to understand. That's why the Bible says they're lost. They're blind. And even many Christians who join up with those who are lost and blind join in the parade of, look at these people. But yet be faithful to the Lord. 
please God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of the Republicans, <laughs> Democrats. Does Biden like it? Does Trump like it? Does your coach like it? What about your best friend? What about the guy you're seeing or the girl that you're dating? What about your spouse that isn't here? What about the family that is putting the pressure on you? Do all to the glory of God. It's all about Jesus. It's all about what He wants. God rebuked these priests for showing preference in instruction. James put it this way in chapter number one and chapter number two of his epistle. He said when rich people came to church in the New Testament, the church leaders were saying, oh, come and sit down front. Move down here. You, you don't have anything. You, you let them put their feet on you. If the mayor of Keystone showed up, or the governor of the state, would we be honored? Of course we would, but not at the expense of God's people. And if we are preferential in our treatment of others, especially as we dispense the truth, then that reveals our heart and our intention. And God says to these people, I have no respect for you. And the people see right through the veneer. Parent-wise, Jacob did this with his 12 boys. He doted on Joseph. And what happened? He showed favoritism, which is what his daddy and mama did to him. Showing partiality to any group, the rich and powerful or influential, is always a temptation for spiritual leaders. But children as well, let's flip the page, will not respect parents who just go along to get along. They may get upset at you. Your kids may not understand. But I have to say to the kids, to my own kids, I say this to them as well. Your parents have lived longer and seen more life than you. They know more of what you need to have and what you should avoid. And here is God telling these priests, you, you have the map. You have the instruction book. And when people are coming, you're taking whatever they're giving. You're listening to their instruction. You are fearing them more than you're fearing me. So guess what? I don't respect you. They don't either. But you have the instructions. Give them this. Moms and dads, don't be afraid to parent at home. Don't be afraid to say, it's a scary word. I'm about to use a scary word. Okay? No. Why? Just because I said so. Because it's not good. Or, or maybe even in our relationships, it's just a communication, as we talked in Sunday school, just talking about it. Love unconditionally. Speak clearly. Be wise but tactful. And I know I'm harping on the parents for a second. Being a parent is the best role you can play in your kid's life. You say, my kid needs a youth pastor. Yeah, I had a youth pastor. Pastor Wesson did. Many of you had a youth pastor, and they made a big impact in my life. But I didn't live with him. I live with mama and daddy. And we sat down at the table with mom and daddy. And they saw my algebra grades when I brought it home. Mrs. Hearn, God bless her. I don't know if she's still living or not. But I learned to sleep in, at 9 o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays in algebra class and not snore with my eyes open. <clears throat> you know, some of, if we expect God to come down to our level in that way and we're not willing to bend our knee, tilt our head toward heaven and say, God, what do you want for me? Things are never going to change in our lives. God has such a great plan for each and every one of us as dads, as moms, as widowers, as divorcees, as those who are separated, those who are single, young adults, young people, wherever you are, whatever you're going through. Levi was such a great example, but we do all to the glory of God. I want you to turn to that verse, and I want us to read that together. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, some of you know it by heart. And then I'm going to ask Pastor Chris and Pastor Weston to come on, our musicians, if you would. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's look at verse number 31. And this is what I want to do. First, I want to have, if you're 19 or younger, 19 or younger, I want you to read it with me first, okay? And then if you're an old person, so if you're 20, right? You should appreciate that. I'm considering you one of the adults, right? You're, if you're an old person like the rest of us, uh, we'll have you read it. So just young people, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Okay, here we go. Whether, all together, one, two, three. Whether, therefore, okay, let's, I'll get there. Well, we'll try it here. We didn't practice this. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Okay, all the young people, one, two, three. 
whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Okay, now let's get the old people in here. Can we get all the men that are over the age that are 20 and older, just the men all together? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. How about all the ladies all together? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Now, everyone together. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. You're going to leave and you're going to go, and that is the mission field. The mission is clear, what God said. Now, what am I going to do about it? Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Be a spiritual leader in the vein of Levi and know that God has a great plan for you. Let's pray. God is in control. We believe that His children will not be forsaken. God is in control. We will choose to remember and never be shaken. There is no power above or beside Him. Control.